other, um, you know, in this, in the plus 20 uh, round, what do you envision uh, uh, might be some additions or uh, subtractions <laughs> from, from, from the WISIS documents? Thank you, Edmund. Um, who would like to reply to that first? Or yeah, happy to take two or three at a time. Great. Yes, hello. Please go ahead. My name is Karsan, uh, part of the Youth IGF. I just wanted to ask, uh, based on the multilateralism scheme of diplomacy that could boost the IGF, I think it's uh, it's two sided in the matter. Uh, there is the northern perspective that actually designs some sort of the content and the nomenclature of how multilateralism is, but in the southern element or the southern perspective, we really do not have the deep understanding of how actually it can operate. So sometimes it feels that the multi-stakeholder approach is right. You know, we speak, come here, we speak, but in the end, it's not quite substantial to present the local sense of what happens in some of the regions that happen here. So how do we put this in a mechanism or a framework that can actually create a change so we could empower more participation and more contextual capacity in a way that multilateralism makes sense in a global perspective rather than just having a one-sided conversation in what the IGF has been. Great, thank you. Um, I'm happy to take one more, um, perhaps in the room now. Yeah, and then we can go to our panelists. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Pete um, from the Tony Blair Institute. Uh, I guess my question is kind of actually somewhat similar to that, uh, but also thinking a little bit more from the industry perspective. Um, and we talk about multi-stakeholder initiatives. I think like one of the feedback that I've gotten from industry folk is that it's really complicated and, and complex and a lot of nuance. And I think it tends to play to the hands of larger players in industry. Um, and so, you know, how do we think about a multi-stakeholder approach that, you know, promotes involvement from smaller organizations and isn't something that's just going to sort of entrench the status quo, so to speak. So, Thank you very much uh, for those questions. Um, great. Yes, Jennifer, please go ahead first. Let's see if I remember all three. I'm going to take a stab at this. Uh, maybe just a quick response to the question from Edmund. I mean, since uh, WISIS plus 10, we have had, you know, the high level uh, panel on enhanced cooperation, uh, um, digital cooperation. I'm sorry about that. And then from that, we had the option paper that was co championed by uh, Germany and UAE. And within that options paper, um, there was the proposal to create the IGF plus. And the IGF plus in, in essence is to enhance and strengthen what we currently have, to not reinvent the wheel, but to enhance the current processes. One of the, uh, a couple of the things that they have in, in that options paper include a policy incubator. And I use that term to, to kind of reflect on the overarching intersessional work that the IGF has done. So it's not just the annual forum, it is the outputs and work that's done by the BPFs, the best practice forums, the NRIs, I'm trying not to use the acronyms so much, the national regional initiatives and youth initiatives, and also the policy network. So the policy incubation part of it is enhanced. The second part is uh, to create that high level uh, leadership panel. And it has since, uh, I think the options paper came out in 2019 or 2020, but earlier this year, We've had the announcement of the leadership panel, which is now, um, you know, sat and they're all named and, and part of their mission and the, the, the reason for this panel to be is to address the existing gaps, to address the gaps where I think uh, our participation uh, participant here has mentioned, how do you kind of make sure this discussion really reaches where you want it to reach? What are the existing mechanisms or how do we improve mechanisms or create new mechanisms to make sure Global South is heard or smaller companies or smaller stakeholders or, or other stakeholders are actually heard? So the leadership panel does have this mandate to, be, to address these existing gaps in the form of advising 
uh, the MAG, which is the multi-stakeholder advisory group of, of the IGF, they are the ones who advise the Secretary General on the agenda of the each uh, each of the, the annual meetings. And another part that they really do need to play is to kind of connect the dots. Because the UN uh, system and all these sister inst institutions are so broad and so vast, and there's so many different um, conversations going on right now that do impact internet governance, they are also tasked to kind of connect the outputs and discussions with the other current processes that are happening um, in UNCTAD, in, in ECOSOC, and also um, all the cybersecurity uh, conversations that are going on. So the leadership panel, their mandates, and we we have, you know, we will, we will remain optimistic and positive that they will be able to fill, fulfill this mandate. So they will be uh, in a kind of role to be able to connect all of these mechanisms together. And then finally, I think when uh, I turn to your question, um, I myself, is um, we're, uh, we're industry, so um, technical community. If you look around the venue and the rooms, you do, do notice that there are fewer of us in, in a lot of the sessions in the agenda. And I think it's uh, a really important to have us there that's number one, because we are the ones who are creating the new technologies, the emerging technologies. We are the ones with the technical know-how, but we also need to be aware of the policy implications and discussions that are happening at the IGF. I don't have a solution for you. I think it is really important for those who are currently active in the space to be able to reach out further to you know our fellow stakeholders, um, and as well as the technical community and industry folk from the private sector, uh, especially from big tech too. I think they do they do come to the forums, they do come to the, the workshops, but we need to be the ones to also make sure they do not entrench their, I guess, advantage uh, because they're able to come here. And I think one more thing that I wanted to leave off with is because of the pandemic, we have shifted very much to working and, and playing and attending conferences in, in a hybrid manner. And I think that equalizes a lot of the playing field as well. So even from a smaller think tank or a smaller, you know, private sector SME, if you're not able to, sorry about that, send delegates to, to the actual location, you'll still be able to participate substantively uh, in all the discussions and sessions. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'll, I'll try and be brief. And I, I once gave a lecture on the aura. <laughs> Not a very good one, I'm sure, on your question. So, you know, what is all this multi-stakeholder stuff about? You know, and, 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 and you know, for, for some of us, for some of us, you can be very cynical about, you know, the interplay between the multi-stakeholder and the multilateral processes. And for some of us in governments, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, you know, governments, and I'm sure this doesn't happen now, you know, had a tendency to go out to public consultation, to have lots of input, you know, from businesses or from other stakeholders, and then completely ignore what was said in the public consultations. And, and you know, this, this, this happened. And, and, and to an extent, you know, even in some of the multilateral uh, organisations now, there's still a sort of reluctance, if you like, to really embrace the multi-stakeholder model. Because the multi-stakeholder model is not just the fact that we come along here and, and discuss things and, and cooperate as, as, as stakeholders together. It's that we actually influence the policy outcomes, that we sit down with governments and we agree things going forward. So, I mean, your point is, 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 is very important indeed. And we're, and we're not naive. You know, we're, 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 you know, not all the stakeholders are going to sit around the UNGA table in 2025. We know that. But we have the opportunity leading up to that to ensure that those government ministers, those presidents, those prime ministers or whatever that sit there, know that from their own country, from their own stakeholders, there's been a process, there are views, there are opinions that they know about the importance of the IGF. So they're not blindsided. So they understand the passion and the excitement that the IGF and the national regional initiatives generates. 
And so we have to do our best as we go along this road to involve as many people as possible and to feed back to our governments and to make sure everyone understands. Yes, there'll be the opportunity for the ITU to feed input into the UN process, uh, for the IGF to feed input into the into the WSIS plus 10 uh, review, WSIS plus 20 review process. There'll be resolutions of the UN CSTD on what you know, should perhaps evolve after 2025 in terms of the action lines, in terms of evolving the action lines to embrace uh, lots of the new challenges we face. But at the end of the day, you're right, it will be down to, to governments to actually agree the resolution. We think if we go down the route that we went for the uh, uh, WSIS plus 10 uh, uh, process, there'll be co-facilitators appointed by the UN, so these will be diplomats, that will, uh, you know, uh, on a regional basis, will take into consideration the views of different bodies, the views of different institutions, the views of different stakeholders, and as I say, the the views of the ITU, UNESCO, and UNCSTD. But it's beholden on us to really ensure that everyone understands the importance of of, of this process, the importance of this. Uh, the the, uh, the multi-stakeholder process in general, but also the importance that the IGF has has become this this place where people can stand up, can come together and discuss issues. It was so good meeting some of the uh, the African parliamentarians the other morning. I mean, you know, to have people that actually make decision in the room and listening to their stakeholders is 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 is, is great. I mean, and you know, we're very fortunate. Also, that we have think tanks. We should, you know, uh, you're a s stakeholder. I mean, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, go up to Tony Blair and tell him he's a stakeholder. I, you know, met him briefly once, but a long time ago. Uh, but uh, you know, the Tony Blair Institute. There's lots of other uh, uh, think tanks that do uh, an enormous work in, in in providing some of the intellectual backbone to this uh, uh, to this process. And so I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, so I will now turn to um, virtual questions. Um, I believe we have a question from Vladimir. Vladimir, please go ahead. Yes, uh, th th thank, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Vladimir Minkin. Uh, thank you very much, Nigel. Yes. <laughs> yes, we worked together for many, many years in the 03, 05, as well as in the, in the younger. L let me say that uh, when we uh, speak about multi-stakeholderism, we speak a lot of multi-stakeholderism and very seldom about multilateral process. But if we, if we look to uh, para 35 of Tunis agenda, we have very clear mention the distinguish of roles. And this distinguish and the separate role for states and private sector was supported at uh, continue to be the case in uh, Junger Resolution 125 and Para 59. And I think we should estimate how is the situation now after 20 years of Tunis on this area. Another point um, also there, uh, we, we could see what was uh, request from us uh, uh, at this resolution 125 on uh, forum and for enhanced cooperation. Unfortunately, what was requested for enhanced cooperation, we were unlucky to finalize our work, but we should consider what we will report to the General Assembly on that. We have time. Maybe we could find some other solution for improving uh, the IGF and uh, any, any other solution, but we should agree on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vladimir. Are there any other virtual questions? Please don't be afraid to put your hand up or if you're struggling to raise your hand in, uh, you can always drop a message in the chat. And we can also look in the room. Yes, great. Thank you. We've got a hand in the room. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eva from Botswana. Um, mine is a simple one. I'm just new in this process. I just want to know if WCS or internet governance uh, at the ITU level, of course, have uh, maybe some guiding principles in terms of resolutions, you know, guiding on what to do, how to do, and what to achieve at the end of all this. Because if you are a newbie and you hear all these buzzwords being thrown around, you, you kind of like feeling overwhelmed. But the, you know, um, of course in Botswana, there are a lot of activities, but what could be missing is how do you get to get all the fragmented pieces together and you know channel them such that the country benefits from you know talks that are, 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 are or discussions that are taking place here such that when one comes the the next time they know what you know they go back and make impact and know how to give back and looking forward to you know uh, other new things that they could always you know take back home thank you Thank you very much. And do we have any other questions in the room or online? I can take one more and then we'll head to our speakers. Great. Um, all right. In that case, we'll head over to our speakers, starting with Jennifer. Maybe you'd like to answer the question on, on um, actually, I think I'm going to try to attempt to answer the question from our participant from Botswana. Um, I once was also a newbie coming into the, the IGF and being overwhelmed with all the topics, all the acronyms that I'm trying very hard not to use as well. I think the very first thing that uh, one can do starting back at home as well is I'm not sure if there is a Botswana IGF, uh, a national in initiative there, but the, if there isn't, that could be some the first thing that you, you might want to look at, at, at starting something that would actually build capacity within your national borders, within, you know, the stakeholders that you, in, within your community or your youth community to understand what integrant governance is all about, to understand the topics that are being discussed here. Um, we are, you know, the, 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 the topics that we discuss at IGF is very broad and very varied. If you even look at the agenda, there could be sessions on child online safety, there's sessions on cybersecurity, there's sessions on human rights, uh, freedom of expression, there's a parliamentarian roundtable, there's a whole bunch of uh, main plenary sessions that give very, very high level uh, overview of, of the overarching themes and topics of the, of the IGF each year. I think the IGF Secretariat does a very good job with creating toolkits that you'll be able to take and implement and scale up or scale down to be able to understand in a very clear sense uh, what is being discussed. And, and now I turn to the second part of it. It's not just the, the topics and subjects being discussed, where these processes then go, where do these discussions and what we talk about, where do they then feed into? And, and I guess our lightning talk is about WSIS plus 20, but there are many different channels and other uh, decision-making bodies, forums, and also these are all multilateral mechanisms because at the end of the day, the, the people who do make the decisions are the, the state actors. They are the ones who are able to make these decisions. But the the context, the discussion, and uh, uh, um, the gathering of the outputs really do need to be multi-stakeholder. So just to recap, um, try to contact the uh, IGF secretary to see if there is any initiative within your home region or your regional, sub-regional uh, uh, IGFs. I think there is uh, definitely several sub-regional IGFs in Africa. So you'll be able to learn uh, first on the topics, then on the systems and the mechanisms uh, where these processes then feed into. I think that is the first step. And then the second step is, and I do hope you come to 2023 IGF in Kyoto in my home region, then you'll have a little bit more insight into how you can effectively participate and sit at the decision-making tables and, and talk about uh, policy that impact your lives back in your country or back in your community. I, I think these are, are the very uh, concrete steps you can take. No, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a long road, isn't it, to uh, 
you know, to, to, to ensure that we have the national mechanisms in place to feed up into the, in, into the global initiatives. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not trivializing it uh, at all how, you know, how, how complex some of this is. Uh, in the early days of the IGF and when we had the first national and regional initiatives, I think it was very surprising to uh, you know many of us that you know they sprung up in countries which you know uh, where perhaps you know civil society and the technical community hadn't really been welcomed before at the government table, and uh, those initiatives did 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 show how they could contribute because you know this and and you know I'll I'll answer the first question you know we're we're talking about a we're talk this this notion of enhanced cooperation was something that's in the in the Tunis agenda and means different uh, things to different people. I suppose enhanced cooperation, if we take it, you know, from a, a sort of an English understanding point of view, is is people coming together to to to, to really cooperate in 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 a sense that that you know that makes a difference to really work together to to solve problems to really work together to ensure that uh, you know things can be taken for uh, issues can be taken forward and and it's not you know it's it's, it's not just the, the government listening to the stakeholders it's the stakeholders also listening to the governments as well i mean this is a a two way process and I think what we've learned, uh, you know, since it's since 2005 and the and the crafting of the Tunis agenda is 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 that stakeholders have so many different roles. The technical community plays a role in in the civil, in the, if you like, the civil structures of of society in providing networks, in providing connectivity, in providing ways that people can uh, 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 connect. The technical community obviously plays a, an in incredibly important role in, 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 in ensuring that the internet you know, uh, functions. Uh, the business community, as, as, as we've seen, plays obviously a role you know, in, in, in providing the infrastructure and, and going the extra mile to, 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 in, to, to ensure that, there's, you know, that the, the, the systems work. And, and governments also have to play a role, not just in, in public policy issues, but we, you know, to get involved in the other in the in the other discussions and uh, you know at this uh, at this uh, IGF we've reflected to an extent that there's there's other bodies where uh, important work is is being taken forward obviously in the in the in the ITU etc but also in the internet engineering task force which sets many of the standards which underpin the you know the workings of the internet uh, in the OECD, in UNESCO, there's many other, many other bodies which uh, you know uh, provide a, a, a lot of input into this debate. So I think you know the answer to the question is that the role of stakeholders is is, is going to evolve. Yes, governments will always have an, a, an important role in this in this equation, but other stakeholders beyond what was mentioned in. Uh, Tunis agenda, academics, scientists, uh, you know, so many other groups, as, as we saw in the global pandemic. I mean, uh, you know, during the global pandemic, what would have happened if there were no, uh, you know, no stakeholders involved in the process? What would have happened if there were no technical community to uh, ensure we had the networks that the health professionals could do their could do their tasks, that the public services that uh, reached out to the people. What would happen in the climate discussions, COP? I mean, can you imagine that the climate discussions could just take place with governments? Uh, you know, governments are critically important to make those decisions as governments are doing in the climate agenda. And it's, it's, it's incredible to see what decisions governments can, when they come together, can, can make. But, you know, they are they are guided by the scientists. They are guided by the people that understand. You know, some of the real issues. So yeah, you know, it's a complex mixture, but uh, everyone has a role. Thank you both. And, you know, just to say thank you, Jennifer, so much for outlining some of those ways that people can get more involved or get things started. Um, whatever country or region uh, you're in, 
definitely the IGF secretariat has toolkits, things you can use to get involved. It all can be very overwhelming. It's my first IGF. Um, so it can be overwhelming to even ask the question or know what question to ask about an acronym, but lean on the people around you. We're a community here. We're a multi-stakeholder community. Um, and one of the benefits of that is being able to be open, honest with each other and outreach to each other. So um, just wanted to give special thanks to Jennifer for outlining um, some of those resources. Um, Great. Um, I think we have time for maybe a couple last questions. If anyone would like to, in the room or virtually, opening it uh, completely up. Any last questions? Uh, yeah, Ernest, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Ernest Mafuta. I'm the current chair of Affordable Internet Access under Internet Society. So uh, mine is not a question, but some form of a recommendation. Yeah. Um, going back to the Y6 plus 10, some of the words which were being echoed by then was access, the digital divide, uh, capacity, development, cybersecurity. And we see all these um, sessions happening right now and they're being shaped. So I would also just like to recommend that going forward in the plus 20, we should continue voicing out on the very same things and also add on the gaps that we're missing because we all know that um, the goal is universal connectivity, affordability, and the cost of devices and everything. So going forward, I think we should move in that direction because there's no time. We keep on going year by year and time is moving. So in order for us to achieve this meaningful access, there is need for us to catch up and also maybe to redesign a model on how the IGF can work. Maybe we're missing gaps, maybe it's policy on the local level, or maybe it's on an international level. So let's look at that and to see how we can shape it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for this vital session. My name is Alan Ramirez. I am from Peru. I am uh, actually a MAC member uh, on IGF. And I have this question. Do you consider that there is a meaningful difference in an annual IGF taking place in a developing country versus uh, an IGF in uh, developed countries? That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Great. Were you all able to hear that question? Okay, from Alan. Alan, I might just give you, if it's okay, my microphone. I don't know if we quite. Sorry. Oh, perfect. You couldn't, couldn't hear Much me? Better. Much better. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I was I was asking, uh, what do you think about uh, if there any considerable difference between an IGF taking place in a developed country versus an IGF taking place in a develop, developing countries. For example, I, I, is Ethiopia this year, but next year is going to be Japan. And in following years, we we'll probably, I think, need to be think of more developing countries as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for repeating that, Alan. Um, were there any qu virtual questions? Again, I want to make sure everyone attending virtually has the chance uh, to be heard, whether it's a comment or a question. Okay. Um, uh, in that case, then uh, Nigel and Jennifer, please go ahead. Um, first, I wanted to, oh, yes, of course. Uh, thank you for your comments. I know it was a, not a question, but a recommendation. And I think it's really important that we do keep in mind that we are trying to have meaningful connectivity for all of us. I think we just reached the 8 billion mark of our species on this planet. So the undertaking is very large and it does require a multi-stakeholder approach to be able to, to do that. So thank you for this. And we will, of course, I mean, collectively uh, work towards having this as a success. Um, a brief response really to your question. I think it's a really good question because, and I also wanna frame it in the, in the sense of a, a regional context as well. 
before the IGF was here uh, in the Africa continent, um, Ethiopia, we've had the IGF in Europe and Eastern Europe for the last four years. And I know this because I also was previously on the MAG and there was a lot of discussion about how are we sitting here talking about meaningful inclusion, access and all of that, but just staying and keeping the IGF in just one region or one particular uh, segment or just you know developed versus developing countries. And, and I agree with you, there is a big difference because here the discussions, the topics, the people who participate at the IGF reflects everywhere uh, at the venue. Uh, last year we had it in Poland, there was a lot of uh, Polish participants, and it was very interesting for them to be able to understand what the IGF is, what internet governance is, and bring their local issues and topics to the table. And it's very, very imperative that we have it in the Africa continent as well. Here in Ethiopia, we have a lot more participation from the African states, which is then further enhanced uh, when they take back these discussions and policy issues and, and topics and outcomes to their home country. So going forward, I am very happy that it will go back to my home region, which is Asia Pacific. I think the last time we had it in Asia Pacific was possibly my very first IGF in Istanbul. Istanbul, Istanbul, Istanbul yeah, Istanbul. Uh, so uh, quite a several years ago, it's been long overdue in our region, Asia Pacific. And I think that it would be a very good opportunity for uh, participation to rise from Asia Pacific as well. Um, I think it's imperative for, I guess, the MAG or the IGF uh, Secretariat or DESA to really strongly consider uh, uh, the balancing and rotation of, of this uh, forum. I know it's very difficult to, to achieve, but it is very imperative that we do do that. And also, of course, the developing country versus the developed countries, the issues definitely do vary and giving prominence to those issues are also very important. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. I just wanted to get one uh, question from Chris online. He's just put his hand up. So in our remaining last minute, uh, Chris, please go ahead and then we'll hand over to Nigel to finish off. Chris, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. I, I saw you actually looking if we still have time to take my question. So it's good you actually give me the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to chip in one thing. I think we, we, we usually talk about uh, digital inclusion and leaving no one behind. I think it's important that we start thinking of how we can include persons living with disability and carrying them along in all these conversations we have in. One thing I've, 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 I've seen, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that during this IGF, I've really not seen a lot of options for persons living with disabilities. I don't know if it was due to the fact that maybe they didn't register or something. I think that gap is actually there. So we need to start thinking of how we can include them so that we do not leave anyone behind. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. Yes, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Chris, for that, and thank you for the uh, comments uh, here in the here in the room. I'll be very brief because we must finish because you'll have other things to to do. First of all, on the on the gaps, yes, I mean this is this is absolutely fundamental. You know, I mentioned that we agreed action lines in two thousand and five. You know, the the WISIS action lines, and I really do hope, you know, passionately that as we move towards 2025, the discussion on the WISIS review is how we evolve those, how we update them, how we ensure that the challenges that we face today on the internet are reflected in the, in the overall resolution that comes out of the UNGA in 2025. It's, it's beholden on ourselves, it's our responsibility to make sure that we address those gaps that the there are, you know, that there still are. And in, 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 in just on a reflection on your, your, your question, sir, yeah. I mean, for me, you know, coming here and coming to Jawa Passara in, uh, in, in Brazil in 2015, going to Nairobi in 2011 were the highlights. Now I can't quite remember everything I forget at my age, but, you know, the passion, the commitment, the, you know, the sheer involvement that we see here in, in, in Ethiopia, 
and that we saw in Jayapasara for the young people that stood up in the final ceremony and said, our government needs to change course on various policies, those brave people that did that, and the same in, uh, in, in other countries. So, yes, I mean, it, it, it's great to go to different parts of the world and hear, and as, as, uh, as, as Jennifer said, to hear different perspectives from different regions. And I really do hope that, you know, the IGF can... Uh, you know, swing round. But of course, it you know there are financial and logistical considerations, which uh, which uh, you know are, are, are problems as well. I I think we ought to. Fall, but I'll hand back to my boss. <laughs> Uh, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Apologies. I think we've gone three minutes over, but we started three minutes late, so hopefully that's okay. But thank you so much for sharing your time today. Um, I think this was a really useful conversation and exchange. Um, I know what I really enjoyed about it um, as a chair of this session was really having that audience engagement, and it almost turned into a discussion, a uh, multi-stakeholder discussion, which was really useful. Um, so I hope you really enjoy uh, the last day tomorrow of the IGF. Can you believe it's here already? And please do come up and chat to us after. If you have any other questions, comments, we wanna keep this conversation going. So please do engage with us. Um, let's not stop the conversation here. Thank you so much for your time.